Good evening. So um, tonight I've uh, chosen to talk about allergies for maybe 15 or 20 minutes um, before answering any questions that you have uh, on allergies, how to heal allergies, um, uh, causes of allergies in your case, and also any other health related questions uh, that you want to ask me uh, this evening. So I thought I'd talk about allergies because allergies have um, are troubling a lot of people these days. Really become much more common over the last 40 years since I since I got into macrobiotics, oriental medicine, shiatsu, uh, etc., and started giving uh, consultations uh, to people with a variety of health problems. So very curious. 40 years ago, um, quite small numbers of people had hay fever. Uh, or allergies to airborne substances. Um, a few people had food allergies, um, but there was none of this, you know, kind of, uh, you know, many people having allergies to gluten and having problems with that. So something has really changed in the last 40 years. Um, now, uh, in the UK, uh, about a tenth of the population have hay fever, about six million people suffer from hay fever every year, which can be uh, pretty unpleasant uh, and debilitating. And food allergies uh, have increased enormously. Um, some months ago, I went into a, uh, actually last end of last year, went into a kind of healthy vegetarian restaurant and uh, every, every dish um, had a whole line of symbols after it, you know. Um, you know, whether it had gluten in, whether it had peanuts in, whether it had this, that, 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 you know, in. And I thought, wow, this, this is, this is seriously strange. It is, this is seriously strange that so many people um, have uh, food intolerances or allergies to so many substances. Um, so something has, has uh, really changed in people's health. So this is what I want to look into. Um, before we get into that, let's just kind of define a little bit what we mean by an allergy. An allergy is an allergic response. It's where uh, the, uh, our immune system sets up a response to a non-harmful, and uh, normally a non-harmful substance. So a good example is uh, pollen in the air. Um, we've been Breathing in pollen ever since uh, ever since we existed millions of years ago, um, pollen doesn't do us any harm. Um, but for some reason, the body thinks it's being attacked, and it sets up the kind of response that it would set up to a virus or a bacteria or a fungus, or something that was genuinely genuinely trying to attack the body. Um, part of that response is to produce a chemical called histamine. Uh, you probably heard about antihistamines, especially if, if you have allergies, because people with allergies very often are given uh, drugs, um, medications with antihistamines in. This is to counteract the histamine that the body naturally creates. Uh, it's in the blood and, um, uh, and it's in the cells um, which are being irritated. And um, what it does is it, uh, it makes the blood capillary blood capillaries swell up so that more blood can come to that place uh, and so the body can bring more white blood cells, the body's defense cells uh, to that place and uh, kind of other chemicals to to fight um, an infection, fight bacteria, viruses, etc. Um, and when and so there's inflammation and the tissue swells, maybe it becomes more red because there's more blood um, maybe there's mucus production, um, you know, etc. So if we have, if there's a potential infection, then that's a very good thing. But if it's an allergy uh, to pollen or something else, um, it's uh, <clears throat> very annoying because suddenly your your nose starts swelling up, your eyes become inflamed, your eyes become watery, um, um, and also the throat may start swelling up as well. Um, and if people have a really severe allergy, then um, the throat may, may, may swell up so much, um, um, uh, described as anaphylactic shock, and the throat can actually swell up so much that people can't breathe and, and die. 
Um, so, so analogy is this um, um, kind of reaction to something that isn't isn't normally harmful, uh, with the body thinking that it is harmful. Um, so there are airborne allergies um, to pollen, dust, you know, substances in the air. Uh, then there are food allergies where the body, same kind of process, but happening in the gut rather than in the lungs and sinuses. The body is reacting to foods or substances within certain foods. A very common one is gluten. Um, some people react to substances in nuts, eggs, fruits, and, and all kinds of different foods. Um, then we could add to that also skin allergies. Um, some people, um, some people, when they come in contact with certain substances, uh, develop a rash or, or an eczema um, um, as, a, as a kind of reaction uh, to, to that substance. Um, um, so these are the kind of main main places people get allergies. The Western me medical approach is um, mostly twofold. One is um, if if um, if you can avoid the the allergen, um, the substance that we're allergic to is called an allergen. It stimulates the an aller, uh, allergic reaction. If you can avoid the allergen, then do that. Uh, that can be relatively easy. If it's if it's a food, you can just uh, be careful not to eat that food. Uh, not always easy if you're eating out. But with airborne um, allergens like pollen and um, uh, dust mites, cat hairs, etc., uh, it's it's often not easy at all. Um, um, then the second line, the second line of um, kind of action um, or defense is to use uh, different kinds of medications, as I say, often containing antihistamines uh, to reduce the inflammation, to reduce the symptom. However. Um, there's, um, there's, it's the treatment is basically symptomatic. It's not getting to the basic cause uh, of the allergies. And there's, um, well, I've done a certain amount of research, but I can't find very much scientific research into the actual underlying causes of uh, um, of allergies, and you know some kind of explanation why. Um, uh, ex uh, allergies are really uh, rising almost exponentially in modern society. So let's let's take a look from a more holistic um, point of view uh, why people uh, do, uh, why allergies have become so common. <coughs> so this is all about our boundary. Um, because the the world is full of bacteria, viruses, harmful substances, we need to have a, a, a strong boundary from the outside. Um, so a very obvious boundary is our skin. The skin is quite fairly easy to make a boundary because it can be quite thick. Um, it's not having to take in anything. Um, so it can be quite a thick barrier um, and, and it's generally pretty effective. Um, then uh, sinuses and throat and lungs, different situation because our lungs need to um, uh, take in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide. So there has to be, um, there can't be like a thick skin because the, the oxygen would never get through. So actually the layer, the layer, uh, when I found this out, I just found it just unbelievable. Like it just, it's a miracle how the body works. The, the, the space between the air in the lung and the blood in the blood capillary, so the, the lungs end in these little sacs and then the blood capillaries wrap around them. And then the space between the air, air in the middle and the, and the blood is something like one micrometer. That's a thousandth of a millimeter. So it's just, you know, it's just incredibly thin. Um, and that's what it has to be. So the oxygen can come in, uh, can come in, and the carbon dioxide come out. But the trouble is with it, with this very thin layer, which is also the same mucous membrane that we have through our lungs and through our throat and and nose and sinuses as well, is that it's obviously very prone to um, um, when you've got a thin layer, it's much more difficult to keep things out: viruses, bacteria, dust, you know, other other foreign particles. So the lungs are a place where the boundary can easily become weak. 
and then things start getting inside which shouldn't get inside. And the immune system particularly reacts to proteins. So when um, the proteins of pollen or cat hairs or other substances or certain foods get into either the lungs or, uh, or the, gut, the lining of the gut, uh, the lining of the gut is exactly the same. There has to be a very thin layer, actually only one layer of cells thick, so really microscopically thin layer. And if you just imagine what's in your gut, um, all this food breaking down with a really a lot of bacteria, um, maybe some, maybe around half a kilo of bacteria we have in our gut, plus viruses, plus fungi, plus protozoans, um, all kinds of stuff. And this one layer of cells has to keep all of that out. That's a tough job. Um, so um, when this boundary becomes weak, then uh, uh, the, the, um, the proteins start getting in, like gluten or proteins from eggs or, or nuts or, or other, you know, other foods. The body thinks it's being attacked, sets up an immune, immune reaction, if it's in the lungs, we get um, uh, maybe uh, our nose blocks up, runny eyes, um, cough, uh, maybe a bit of difficulty breathing. Some some form the, some some cases of asthma are called uh, allergic uh, asthma because it can be triggered by certain um, allergens that people breathe in. Um, or if it's in the gut, then people get uh, pain in the gut. Their gut may start contracting may want to start getting rid of the food. People may have diarrhea or feel nauseous, um, 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 you know, etc. So, so the question really uh, to understand is um, why does the boundary become weak? Um, if, we just, if we just try to solve allergies by avoiding the substance or treating the inflammation with antihistamines, etc., it means that we're going to go on suffering that allergy for the, maybe for the rest of our life or at least you know for a number of years or, or quite long term um, if we could really understand the cause of these um, these uh, membranes uh, these, the, these boundaries becoming weak if we could change that then we, we'd um, you know um, we can do something about uh, healing or, or getting rid of the allergies so we need to understand what, what weakens that boundary. Um, in my view, it's, it's a number of things. Uh, I would say number one is food. Um, in, in macrobiotic way of looking at, uh, looking at life, uh, everything is everything we can describe, everything in terms of yin and yang, these kind of polar opposites. Uh, we have dry and wet and up and down and hot and cold and... Uh, acid and alkaline and you know everything fluctuates between these two opposites and in some ways you could say life our life depends on maintaining a balance a balance in our pH um, between acid and alkaline a balance in our temperature a basic, uh, a, a, a balance between sodium and potassium different hormones you know etc uh, life is about balance um, and among foods, um, certain foods um, make tissues uh, tighter, stronger, and uh, create a better barrier in the mucous membranes uh, of the respiratory system and the gut. And these are particularly um, whole foods, whole grains, whole beans, whole vegetables, fibrous vegetables, and also mineral rich foods like broth soups, Soups made with sea vegetables can be useful because they contain a lot of minerals. Um, but just you know, broth soups um, seasoned with salt, herb salt, miso, tamari, shoyu, um, uh, those kind of things. Um, um, broth soups are really hot, mineral-rich liquid. So um, these uh, strengthen the body and strengthen the cells. Um, some animal food could, or you know, can also, if one chooses to eat that, you know, within within one's diet, uh, could also be strengthening for these body cells. Foods then there, there are other foods which really weaken um, these uh, mucous membranes, especially when in macrobiotics, what we would call expansive or yin foods. 
Um, and these are especially processed foods. Um, number one, sugar, um, but also other processed foods lacking fiber, uh, white flour products, um, uh, pasteurized milk. Um, and you know, I think this is this is really is why this, that you know the main reason why there is such a ri uh, rise in allergies, because in the last forty years there's been such a big increase in eating processed foods. Um, so instead of eating wholemeal bread, it's uh, it's processed white bread with additives. An awful lot of breads have added sugar. Um, um, you know, white pastry, almost everything has sugar in it, sauces, desserts, tins, tin fish often has, <laughs> often has sugar in you know, sugar is in almost everywhere. Um, discovered recently, they even put sugar in cat food. Um, um, so, so I'll, I'll just describe this because actually it's a very, very good, very good illustration. Um, of the effects of sugar. Um, so, uh, one of my cats, 16 years old, uh, started uh, developing uh, arthritis uh, in her in her front legs. Uh, started getting painful walking. Started tiptoeing around. Really didn't want to get up. Uh, so I started looking at the the kind of common cat foods um, that I was feeding her, and was kind of shocked to find that they put sugars in them. Um, I, and I asked uh, um, uh, a vet why they do this, and he said, well, you know, the same reason they put sugar in, in human food, because people enjoy it more and want to buy it more. So I really hunted around and found that there's one or two makes of cat food which don't have sugar in. So I turned over to those kind of foods. And actually, she, her, there's obviously something a little, you know, her, her wrists, if that's what you call a cat's joints, um, uh, are obviously just a little bit a little bit weak, but she's feeling a lot better. She started walking around. She's actually started running again, and she's going outside instead of just kind of lying and not wanting to walk at all. So that was that was just from cut you know primarily from cutting out sugars in her diet. Um, probably rheumatoid arthritis, in, inflammatory arthritis. Um, um, which is often described as an autoimmune disease. So it's sli slightly different to an allergy, autoimmune disease, where the uh, body's white blood cells are attacking its own tissues. Again, <laughs> a real mystery in Western medicine. Western medicine keeps saying, oh, yes, you know, certain thyroid problems are autoimmune diseases. Type 1 diabetes is autoimmune disease. Maybe, maybe type 2 rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and so on and so on. They're discovering more and more, more and more illnesses involve autoimmunity, but they don't get to saying what causes the autoimmunity and how to heal an autoimmune disease. What I find very interesting with autoimmune diseases, what like rheumatoid arthritis, is that a change in diet can heal the problem. So actually. Uh, I would say the autoimmunity is 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 a symptom of the illness. It's not the core. It's not the primary cause of the illness. Um, there are s changes in the cells, and then the body thinks, ah, these these cells have become um, um, uh, unnatural, and so it, so attacks them. So the autoimmunity really is 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 a, is one of the symptoms. It's not the, the underlying cause. Um, and I've seen people with other, you know, thyroid issues and other problems described as being autoimmune problems, um, at, you know, heal them through changes in diet and lifestyle, etc. So really the same thing with, um, with allergies, this, you know, this abundance of processed foods um, and especially sugar and anything really, I think, is, is a prime cause of allergies. Um, you have to kind of wonder why food supermarkets are so big. <laughs> if you go into a, well, I, you know, I became conscious in the 1970s and 80s when we had whole food shops and you could, you could go into a, sh you could go into a room that was, you know, the size of a decent sized living room and that would have all the foods you needed to eat healthily, a range of different grains, beans, seeds, nuts, vegetables, you know, some fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, you know etc. All the food you needed <laughs> were in the form of whole foods, real foods, <laughs> you could have in one room. Um, so why do supermarkets need to be so vast? It's because they're full of processed foods. 
So you have a whole um, breakfast cereal aisle. And, you know, and um, so you can go and buy a nice, you know, box of cornflakes or, or, you know, Rice Krispies or something like that. You know, for two or three pounds, um, which has, you know, about, about this much grain in, which probably cost about 15 or 20 pence. And then they've taken a lot of the goodness out of it, a lot of the bran and the brown stuff and the vitamins and minerals. And they feed that to cattle because it's good for cattle um, or put it in pet food. And then they add and then they add a lot, uh, add sugar and then, and then they add vitamins and minerals so they can advertise it with added vitamins and minerals, you know, um, you know, and so you have to have a whole aisle of all these Cocoa Pops and all these different kinds, you know, which are all pretty terrible for the health. What you could do instead in your whole food shop or your health food shop these days is um, buy yourself some porridge oats some quinoa, some rice flakes and millet flakes and, um, you know, and uh, or some whole grains and you know, make make your own make your own breakfasts, make your own granolas, you know, etc. Uh, much healthier. So that's the, that, you know, the reason we have such big super supermarkets is because capitalism managed to sell um, uh, choice um, of processed foods to the general public and make them think that this is a really good idea. Actually, it is really for health. It is really one of the worst ideas. And really what we need is a revolution in food, which is beginning to happen where people go back to cooking real food. You buy grains, you buy beans, you buy, if you eat fish, if you eat eggs, uh, you buy vegetables, you buy seeds, and you make food from real foods. If we all did that, really allergies would, would dramatically decrease. Um, you might wonder why I have kind of confidence in saying that, and that's because over the years I've seen a lot of people with different allergies, a lot of people with hay, hay fever who I've seen eating a more balanced um, whole food diet, uh, macrobiotic type diet, um, have seen their hay fever gradually decrease and you know and very often disappear. Uh, I've seen people with many people with gluten allergies who have to be careful with gluten allergies. A lot of people who react to foods kind of jump to the conclusion it's gluten when it may not be. Uh, it may be that the food is just rather indigestible, that there's a food intolerance going on. Um, but people who genuinely um, get ill from gluten, um, I've seen people heal that by healing their intestines. An allergy is, is, a, is a, including gluten allergy, it's not a problem with what's out there, it's, a pro it's an intestine problem. And so what you need to do is to heal it, is to heal your intestines. And that means stop eating sugar, stop eating processed foods, um, start eating whole foods, um, uh, buy unpasteurized sauerkraut, learn how to make your own brine pickles, which have fantastic probiotics in, which are gonna recolonize your gut with uh, helpful bacteria. And those helpful bacteria um, also help defend the intestine um, from uh, more harmful bacteria, um, uh, um, fungi, molds, etc. as well. So really I've seen a, a lot of people um, diminish their uh, or get rid of their allergies. Um, it can take time, um, but it's definitely possible. Um, one other food which I think is uh, plays quite a big part for a lot of people in allergies it, uh, are dairy foods. Um, um, dairy foods, uh, a lot of people in the world, um, you know, dairy foods, milk is meant as, as baby food. That's what in the whole of the mammal kingdom, no other mammal other than some human beings consume dairy food once, once they've grown past being a baby. But particularly in Europe, um, um, people developed uh, dairy foods, um, parts of the Middle East, and, um, and kept the enzymes which are necessary for breaking down dairy foods. Um, uh, many parts of the world, people don't have those enzymes. However, um, even um, even in people that can break down the dairy food, um, I think dairy food still is is uh, creates a lot of problems. Not not only does it create a lot of mucus, um, but I think uh, a lot of people find I've seen a lot of clients who find that 
just giving up milk um, or other dairy foods has really um, diminished their um, hay fever, other airborne allergies, um, allergic um, asthma, uh, and various gut allergies as well. So I'd also highly recommend uh, stop eating dairy foods. Not nearly as difficult as it used to be. Uh, if you go to our International Macrobiotic School website, there's a, um, there's a free um, um, kind of brochure you can download on how to give up dairy foods, um, how you can use replacements. Um, if, you're, if dairy foods are a significant part of your diet and providing protein and useful fats, etc., you need to know what you can replace it with. Um, rather than just kind of cutting it out, it's good to know, you know other things that you can eat. Uh, instead. So in summary I would say um, a more natural approach to uh, allergies um, is very often successful in um, reducing or getting rid of those um, uh, um, uh, uh, allergies. Um, okay so I'm going to have a look and see who's here and to uh, see if there's some questions. Uh, so Virka, uh, good to have you here, and Claire. Chlorine, can't use swimming pools, even if salt pools. Um, so I haven't, I haven't talked a lot about chemicals. Um, um, I think uh, food is a major cause of allergies. I think uh, probably another cause in general is our exposure to a much wider range of chemicals than has ever happened in, in human evolution before. And this can you know, weaken our boundaries. Um, um, but also if our boundaries become weak, then we can be more prone to these chemicals. So for example, chlorine uh, in a swimming pool. So, um, so Claire, uh, so you're a top fan. <laughs> that's, that's a nice thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so that suggests, you know, there's a bit of weakness um, in your lungs, respiratory tract. Um, in, or in oriental medicine, they actually say that the lung energy is the primary, primary energy which protects the body. So kind of just going a bit more into oriental medicine. Um, 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 oriental medicine sees you know, each organ in the body as not only having certain physical functions but as having a wider range of functions in the body as well. And the first line of the immune system and the defense of the body is seen as being governed by the lungs. Uh, this is fairly obvious um, with airborne um, um, viruses, bacteria or chemicals um, um, but also the but it is also helping strengthen uh, the gut lining uh, and also is very linked with the skin. So very often what one sees when people have you know, more chronic um, long-term allergies is uh, in oriental medicine is a weakness in the lung energy. Um, the lung energy is particularly weakened actually by a lot of the, the foods which I've already described which are causative of, of allergies, processed foods, sugar uh, and dairy foods. So eliminating those foods and eating more whole foods, uh, whole foods and foods with a lot of fiber in, um, whole plant foods, uh, root vegetables etc really help strengthen the lung energy. Um, so I you know quite a few people find um, uh, swimming pools with chlorine in pretty unpleasant and makes them fit and they get a reaction from the body. Um, I'm not sure, sure why you would from salt pools um, uh, if there's really no chlorine in there at all. Um, if, the, if, if the pool is hot then a lot of things can kind of come up in the, uh, in the steam. So I don't know if there's something uh, in that that could be causing problems. Um, okay, um, so I'm wondering if anybody else has questions. Uh, I'm very happy to answer your questions. I see there's you know, quite a few people there. Um, um, I'm very happy to answer your questions on allergies or any other health problems at all. 
Um, so I'm just going to wait. It's up to you now. Uh, if you'd like you know, more information and more discussion, uh, then please come up uh, with your questions. Um, or, you know, Claire, is, I don't know whether it's useful if to, to go into a bit more detail with how to heal the lungs. Um, hi, Jennifer. Thanks for your question. My view on raw chocolate sweetened with coconut sugar. Um, uh, <laughs> <coughs> I'm afraid you're probably not going to like my opinion very much. I'm, I'm going to answer it in two ways. Um, um, raw chocolate sweetened with coconut sugar really is weakening to the lungs and the mucous membranes. So for someone who has allergies, it's bad news. Um, um, raw chocolate, well, coconut sugar, um, you know, using sweeteners such as coconut sugar, rice syrup, barley malt, agave, etc. Um, you know, these, ha these have a weakening effect on the tissues. You know, and okay, we may just use just small amounts, you know, here and there occasionally. Um, you know, and that's if, if our health is strong, that's going to be fine. But if we have a problem that is created um, by processed foods and having a, had an overdose of, uh, of sweeteners, then even these, you know, uh, sweeteners, which people often think as healthy sweeteners, also including honey, um, um, really it'd be best not to eat them at least for a while. And then raw chocolate. So there's uh, cacao in there. Um, this is more of a tropical, tropical um, um, food. Again, has a, quite an expansive effect. You know, again, not terrible. If one's in strong health, one can eat a bit of cacao occasionally. But if one has an allergy um, or other, you know, um, rheumatoid arthritis or certain other problems, which are caused by um, um, uh, having a more yin condition. So my cat's just coming for his supper. It's in the kitchen, but he hasn't found it yet. Um, it, it is going to make those problems worse. Then the other way I'm going to answer that is, is really why, you know, what, what is the, what is the attraction, um, of raw chocolate sweetened with coconut sugar? Um, you know, there, there's, you know, there's a need you know, a lot of people, probably most people from time to time, have a need for something strongly sweet. Um, um, and so one has to look into, you know, what, what, what is that need for something uh, strongly sweet? Um, it may be more on the emotional level that we feel we need something which is more comforting. Um, we may be feeling run down, depressed. Um, unnourished uh, in oriental medicine uh, the sweet taste particularly nourishes it, it is, is the most nourishing taste so if we're feeling un, unnourished either physically or emotionally then often we want a sweet hit and um, uh, chocolate is often you know a food that um, you know people get used to uh, uh, for that sweet hit um, also, it may be you know, some. So you have, so, if you have that craving for strong sweetness, you need to look into what's underneath that. Um, also, it can just be tiredness. You know, one's blood sugar levels are going down, the body's tired, and you're looking for something to give you quick energy, and um, and something sweet. It can be quite effective in doing that. So, particularly if you're over pushing yourself, you're pushing yourself beyond tiredness a lot, you know, that, then that can create a need for sugar as well. So it's not necessarily easy just to say, well, give up the chocolate, you know, give up the strong sweet foods. So what I would say is, you know, make sure you're eating regularly, make sure you're eating nutritious foods regularly, make sure you're eating naturally sweet foods uh, every day. Number one is sweet vegetables, uh, steamed squash, steamed onions, baked vegetables, baked beetroots, um, uh, pumpkin soup, squash soup, um, onion soups, uh, just lots and lots of sweet vegetables. Um, that can really help um, uh, because that truly nourishes the body and the spleen in a good way. 
Number two is, is cooked fruits, you know, um, poached pears, stewed apple. Uh, in macrobiotics, we make very nice fruit jellies using agar agar to, uh, to set the jelly. You can use some apple juice, put some berries or you know, other fruits in, um, make very nice fruit jellies. Um, so you need to make yourself you know, some naturally, um, naturally uh, sweet um, desserts. You might use a touch of, you know, uh, rice syrup, barley malts, you know, uh, other kind of sweeteners in there, uh, concentrated apple juice to make them a bit sweeter, uh, but try not to overdo those. Um, so that you're giving yourself, you know, uh, plenty of, you know, more naturally uh, sweet foods. So I hope that's helpful, Jennifer. Um, and, uh, um, and it's something that you might try. Um, 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 not only will it help, you know, any allergies, and uh, it will also help to strengthen uh, the lungs. It'll help also help strengthen the immunity. So, with the COVID nineteen virus around, I'll, I'll tell you something else about sugar that it that sugar has been shown uh, in scientific experiments to weaken the immune system. So, actually, back in the nineteen seventies. The uh, university in, in California, just trying to think what it's called now, I can't quite remember. They did an experiment of feeding people different forms of sugar. They did refined sugar, um, they did honey, um, they did uh, orange juice, um, can't remember, one or two others. And then they also tried starch uh, from you know, from you know uh, a complex carbohydrate, and then they um, they took people's blood uh, about once an hour, and they mixed that with a bacteria, Staphylococcus bacteria, and then they measured how many of a particular kind of white blood cell called a neutrophil, which is the first line of defense uh, against infections. They they're the first you know the first white blood cells that go and attack um, uh, invading bacteria and viruses they measured the response you know how you know how strong that response was and they found that with refined sugar the neutrophil response was lower for up to five hours same with honey interestingly same with orange juice um, and also fructose it was the same with starch there was no effect whatsoever so this means that if we're eating sugar you know, for breakfast, morning snack, lunch, afternoon snack, some chocolate, etc., you know, after supper, all through the day, that that means um, we've diminished, you know, we've weakened our immune system, our immune response for the whole of the day. It probably only recovers when we're sleeping at night. Really, you know, one of one of the recommendations the government should be giving out right now, in my opinion, is get off processed foods, eat whole foods, especially really reduce um, uh, or or stop eating sugar. Um, so I would say, you know, unfortunately, coconut sugar is also going to is is going to fall into that band of foods that um, is going to is going to weaken uh, those neutrophils um, and. Uh, uh, you know, weaken the immune weaken the immune system, as well as quite possibly uh, uh, contributing to allergies. Um, so, Sarah, hi. Um, good to good to good to have you here. Good to see you uh, recently. Um, if you're concentrating on building your liver energy, but also seeing a need to build lung energy, any suggestions for balancing that? As I know some liver energy stuff is weakening to the lungs. I was noticing more mucus and asthma, so trying to cook more lung energy food, but wondered if any advice on still being able to do this in a way to keep up the emphasis on the liver energy. Okay, so this is um, you know, a little bit, little bit more in depth. So uh, I think what Sarah's talking about is that if our, if our liver gets congested, especially if we've eaten um, processed foods, a lot of fatty foods, animal foods, dairy foods, uh, sugary foods, etc. Then what's very helpful for the liver is to eat a lot of light vegetable dishes um, and possibly vegetable juices. 
Uh, also, fruit juices can be helpful. Um, but if we overdo these kind of more light, expansive foods, they can start weakening the lungs. So what we can do, Sarah, is, is, um, is to eat foods which are very helpful for the liver and help decongest or uh, detox uh, the liver, um, but which aren't so expansive that they're going to weaken the lungs. So some simple things like um, every main meal, you have some steam greens, you have uh, blanched vegetables where you dip, dip carrots, cauliflower, broccoli, uh, you know, swede, you know, different kinds of vegetables in boiling water for just you know, one, one and a half minutes. Take it out, make a nice dressing. Um, so the vegetables are very light. Also making um, various kinds of pickles, um, uh, brine pickles, sour pickles really help the liver. You can squeeze, squeeze some lemon juice, add a little bit of vinegar uh, on, um, on various vegetable dishes, make some nice dressings with sour tastes. Um, um, and also press salads, uh, traditional Japanese um, food preparation. Um, slicing or grating carrots, mouli, cabbage, uh, radishes, courgettes, squash, all kinds of different vegetables very finely, mixing them with salt, putting a heavy weight on top and over two, three, four, five, six hours, uh, some liquid is pressed out. And um, so they're more digestible um, because they've been pressed with salt. You might think they're gonna taste salty, uh, but they don't. Um, um, and and as long as they don't, as long as you haven't used too much salt and they don't taste salty, that's also very opening for the liver. So all those foods are going to be very nice for the liver and kind of okayish for the lungs. And then to strengthen the lungs, we can eat some foods which, uh, in macrobiotic terms, are more more yang, are more kind of heavy gathering. Uh, drier, um, but which aren't so heavy and dry that they're going to um, um, interfere or, or, or block the liver, um, uh, the liver energy. So this is by eating whole grains. Uh, the whole grain, which is in oriental medicine, is most strengthening for the lungs, is short grain brown rice, which you could either boil or pressure cook. Um, um, but um, other whole grains also help the lungs, some lighter whole grains, long grain brown rice, um, barley, quinoa, red quinoa, um, uh, bulgur wheat, uh, buckwheat, etc. You know, all of these whole grains help the lungs. Um, uh, also root vegetables and fibrous vegetables, so kale and hard leafy greens, uh, root vegetables, uh, nice and strengthening for the lungs. Um, Slightly drier foods, you know, some roasted sunflower seeds, um, smaller beans like uh, green or brown lentils, uh, uh, maybe cooked along with carrots, a root vegetable, and some kelp. Um, also using the, 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 the seaweed heziki in particular, uh, energetically it strengthens the lungs. So, um, so those foods will strengthen the lungs. So within your daily food, you're having some of those nice light vegetable dishes to help your liver and you're also having some of the kind of heavier, denser, slightly drier foods uh, which are going to help, help the lungs. Yeah. So I hope that gives you uh, a good, good, you know, good, good, good solution. Hi Justin. Uh, Justine, um, good to have you here. So your son is gluten intolerant. He doesn't get issues with diarrhea etc. But over a period of time of eating it, he gets sore skin and his eyes swell. Um, so, um, interesting that you know his his skin becomes sore, um, um, uh, and also the eyes. So, um, so it suggests you know it, although you know as I was saying before, although gluten seems to be the problem. Um, actually, the problem is that, you know, like so many people, the lining of his intestine has become somewhat weak and then is letting these gluten protein molecules you know, get into the, into, the, into the body, into the gut, and then the body sets up some kind of reaction. So, 
of course, if he can avoid gluten, um, um, that uh, temporarily, that would be good. And um, you probably uh, explored how to do that. Um, if you're into eating whole foods, then um, you can eat uh, grains such as rice and millet and buckwheat and quinoa. Um, and um, a bit difficult to find breads. <laughs> gluten makes such nice bread. But you may be able to find some oat bread um, or some other kind of breads um, which don't have gluten in. Um, but also, if you can, I don't know how old he is, um, if you're quite interested to know how, how old he is, um, it can be difficult with children, but if you could steer him away from um, um, from sugar and processed foods and getting them eating more whole foods and na the naturally sweet foods I described before, you know, that, that could be really helpful in recovering his gut. You know, also seeing if he would eat more fibrous foods. Um, uh, children aren't always that keen on eating greens. Sometimes you can whiz them up in a soup. You can cut them up very, very finely and fry them and they really become quite soft and sweet. Um, so you can try, di try different things to get that fiber in. Um, with younger children, that's often uh, easier because they still <laughs> they still have some respect for <laughs> their parents and the parents' choices. As they get older, it can get more difficult. Um, do make do make particularly with younger well children probably of any age do make kind of more healthy desserts. You know, learn to make fruit crumbles and fruit jellies and um, cook you know cooked fruit and f fruit compote and things um, so that. Uh, they're getting some nice, yummy dessert quali quality, um, you know, make some healthy granola, uh, etc. So that there's things which they can eat and, and enjoy um, 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 so they don't feel deprived and, that, and, that, and they can genuinely cut down on their uh, refined sugar and chocolate and, um, you know, foods like that. Um, if he's getting a sore skin, then as I was saying, that suggests that his lung energy is rather weak. Um, so what I've been describing to you could also help uh, strengthen his lungs. So kind of kind of along those lines. Um, if he's quite young, people, uh, children quite often as they get older, they grow out of certain kind of problems. So that's a possibility uh, as well. Um, Jennifer, you got back and said it tastes good. So you good. You like the sound of what I'm saying. Very good. And again, if you go on, if you go on our website, um, there's uh, another document you can download: how to give up sugar, and that has a lot of dessert recipes in, nice dessert recipes and so, uh, so on, uh, so that you're not feeling deprived. Is carrot better? Um, I think it's slightly better. Um, um, but I think in chocolate, it's, it's actually not the cacao and the carob that's the main problem. It's actually the sugar. Um, you know, and I get people who say, oh, yeah, but, you know, I eat really good quality dark chocolate. You know, it's it's 80 percent. It's 80 percent chocolate. Okay, the question is, what is the other 20 percent? The other 20 percent is some kind of sweetener. Very interesting. Sometime um, t uh, I recommend you try eating 100 percent uh, chocolate. Um, it is very surprising because it has a very strong bitter taste and actually you don't want to eat very much because you can't we can't eat a lot of bitter taste you might have one square or half a square and you know that feels like enough um, which and, and, and you know that's the reason why there's so much sugar put with uh, in chocolate because the cacao is strongly bitter uh, somewhat similar with carob as well so there's nearly always sweetener with it, and actually it's the sweetener that does more harm than, than the actual cacao or carrot. Um, 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 hi Dave, good to have you here. Uh, why do people that consume unpasteurized milk so they find it easier uh, to assimilate? Is the pasteurization killing the bacteria in the milk, or is it denaturing protein, i.e. casein or something else? Hmm, interesting question. <laughs> Thanks for that one, Dave. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not actually sure. That's something which I'd like to, which I would like to uh, investigate um, and learn more. Uh, my, kind, my kind of sense is that when we process any food, it becomes more difficult to digest. And um, 
we've been through strange times around food through the kind of 70s 80s 90s where it started being discovered that eating too many fats were well, particularly well more the 80s that this was discovered that eating too many fats leads to heart disease so this led to skin milk and semi-skin milk and so on um please try if, if you want to drink milk um <coughs> Please try sometime some unpasteurized milk. Uh, when I tried it, I was shocked um, because it felt like a real food. It actually had some life energy in it and it actually felt nourishing. Whereas the normal, you know, everybody just drinks skim milk or semi skimmed. It, it is a denatured food. So I don't know exactly what's happened in that denaturing, but it has made it into a more artificial food. And the body has just learned to digest whole foods because that's what we've eaten for, for millions of years. And the more we denature foods, the more problems it has. So another, another good example of a denatured food is margarine. Um, and, you know, same thing. People thought, well, you know, butter's too fatty. Um, therefore, let's, let's make something less fatty. Um, so we ended up with margarine with a lot of trans fats in, which ended up being people realizing it actually was much worse for you than just eating butter fats. And now there's various kind of um, various, you know, um, better quality margarines. But for me, if, you know, uh, I rarely eat dairy foods, but if I was out in a restaurant or something and I, and I was going to eat, eat something, personally, I would always eat butter because it's it's a real food it's a it has key in it it has life energy in it margarine even some of the better ones are really quite highly processed so they've had a lot of the the life energy and the key knocked out of it um, we're not only eating nutrients we're also eating key and this is why some foods uh, some very simple foods can give us a lot of energy and other foods you can you know sometimes i've eaten you know, poor, poorly, poorly, you know, poorly cooked foods um, in a restaurant. And it's like I eat, I, I, I eat the food and my energy is, is just the same as before the meal. When I when I use, high, you know, good quality whole foods and I and I eat a meal, my energy goes up because I've just eaten key. <laughs> That's what should happen when we eat food. It gives us key and then we have more energy again. Um, but processed foods, um, um, because they've had the key kind of knocked out of them by the, you know, by being pummeled and separated and parts taken out of them, and pumped through endless pipes in factories, and uh, and so on, they've had the life energy, the key knocked out of them, and then they don't give us enough energy. And I think this is one reason why a lot of salt and sugar is put into food, um, in order for it to have some kind of kick um, when people eat it. Um, what we should be getting is the kick from the real food. Um, you know, even you know, like just cooking a whole grain, some brown rice, some quinoa, some barley. If it's well cooked with a tiny amount of salt, you eat it, and you can feel your energy uh, pick up and increase. Um, yeah. So, so that's my kind of take on your question, um, uh, Dave. Uh, I'm not sure. So, I, I, I don't know precisely. Um, um, uh, Adita, uh, good to have you back. Is it possible to calm down one aggressive dementia pa uh, patient with food? What is the cause of dementia and what to eat? Uh, very, very good question. It feels like there, it feels like there's a couple of questions there. Uh, one is the fact that there's a lot of aggression. Um, what happens with dementia? is that um, people become um, what's called disinhibited. Um, their normal inhibitions about expressing emotions um, uh, drops, and then whatever emotions they're feeling inside tend to come out much more easily. Uh, and that can be aggressive ones, it can be loving ones, it can be sad ones, it can be all kinds of different emotions. Um, I, look, I looked after my mum who had vascular dementia the last years of her life and I uh, looked after her uh, regularly and um, actually she, she, she always had the inhibition about touch and expressing love, um, bless her, she was a very, very loving, a very loving good mother 
but as, as far as expressing it openly with a hug or something like that, she was quite inhibited, I think, because that was her education when she was young in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Um, she actually became more loving and uh, uh, as, uh, as her dementia progressed, which was wonderful. She wanted hugs. She loved, you know, touch and attention. And um, yeah, it was really wonderful. She also did lose her temper a few times. Um, um, so one approach could be to reduce um, the aggression. Um, people tend to be more aggressive when they're holding a lot of tension in the liver. <coughs> so by eating a more liver-friendly diet, which is still a really complete, healthy uh, diet, nourishing the whole body, that might reduce the aggression a bit. So foods which, which tend to block the liver or tighten the liver or create tension in the liver, which can easily, which, which will make almost anybody feel more irritable, impatient and angry, are uh, particularly the heavy animal foods like meat, eggs, cheese, chicken. Um, uh, also, um, uh, a lot of salty foods um, will do the same, will tighten the liver. So uh, a more plant-based diet, getting the protein more from beans, tofu, um, maybe soy protein. Um, dementia, people with dementia often want familiar foods. Uh, so what I used to make for my mum was a kind of shepherd's pie. I used to use TVP, not the most amazing stuff, but okay, textured vegetable protein. Uh, soy protein and I'd um, cook that up with onions and tomatoes and things and make a very nice base and then I would use instead of using potato on the top I would cook millet soft and put, put that on the top and she really loved that um, so she was getting vegetarian protein something quite light for her liver um, um, instead of eating minced meat um, also uh, fish um, uh, is much lighter and then plenty of vegetables maybe salad um, cooked fruit, kind of type desserts, things which relax the liver. So, so that might be of help. The aggression may be also be coming because of her um, emotional experiences over her lifetime. She may be holding on to some old angers. Probably not a lot you can do when somebody has developed uh, dementia um, to do emotional healing, unfortunately. Um, when people don't have dementia, we can. There's a lot of emotional healing we can do to to resolve old uh, anger and hatred, and you know, as well as a lot of other emotions. But when people have dementia and they lose that kind of self awareness, um, that becomes difficult. So that would be one approach to um, eat more to reduce the amount of tension in the liver. Uh, the cause of dementia and what to eat to help dementia. Um, 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 unfortunately, I think once dementia has developed, uh, change in food, I think quite possibly could slow down the development in some people. Um, but I've never heard of it reversing dementia. Um, um, but a healthier diet is always worth eating for a number of reasons. You know, uh, not only may it help dementia, it may also help other health problems that a uh, typical 79-year-old may have. It may help reduce uh, you know, pains, headaches, gut problems, you know, all kinds of different things uh, so that they're happier. Um, causes of dementia, uh, kind of various. Um, um, there's uh, the main kind is Alzheimer's where protein deposits form uh, in the brain uh, increasing evidence that a high high animal protein diet is one contributory factor that uh, for example scientific uh, um, 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 research showing that um, uh, scientists are often keen on uh, um, testing out the Mediterranean diet um, which is kind of a well-established diet, which is um, uh, plant-based, 
grains, beans, vegetables, etc., uh, with some fish and, sh and shellfish, and maybe small amounts of other, you know, dairy or other things as well, but not not very much. Um, people eating that kind of diet seem to get less dementia. And then the second most common kind is uh, vascular dementia, where the blood vessels in the brain are diminishing. And what Western medicine says is to help avoid that is to eat the same kind of food which is now advised pretty universally uh, for the heart. Again, a plant-based diet, low animal fats, low meat, chicken, uh, dairy food diet, uh, getting protein more from uh, plant foods, beans, pulses, uh, etc. Um, um, much, much easier to... Um, to avoid, uh, prevent uh, getting dementia than it is to heal it once it starts. So, um, uh, Western medicine, 1980s, uh, really linked eating a lot of animal fats with heart heart disease and uh, strokes caused by um, uh, um, deposits breaking off from arteries. Uh, in the last 10 years, really been seeing how um, um, uh, many cancers are contributed to by um, uh, by diet, by unhealthy diets. Um, uh, then type 2 diabetes, now they're seeing, now that it's becoming so incredibly common, um, they're seeing, yes, mostly a diet and lifestyle, lack of exercise caused a problem. Um, they're beginning to find the same thing with dementia. Dementia is... Um, I think largely a diet and lifestyle caused illness. Um, so hey, there's another reason for eating a healthy, balanced, plant-based diet and, and taking regular exercise. Um, so I hope that's uh, helpful, uh, uh, Edita. Uh, Sarah, okay, good. Sounds like that's helped. Justine, he's, your son's 14. So, um, okay, so you're doing a macrobiotic diet for the last two weeks and he's good at following it, fantastic. Um, so that v may very well help. Um, um, uh, fantastic news. Um, as time goes on, you may need to find, um, you know, as I say, just recipes which he really likes. You know, um, fourteen-year-olds they often like, um, you know, they like their desserts. They often like more protein. Teenage boys. Um, um, you know, beans, tempeh, tofu. He may get, he may like fish a lot. Um, he may even buy some kind of vegetarian sausages sometimes or burgers. You know, that kind of thing might might make him happy and keep, kind of keep him eating well. And Dave, you're not keen on milk, but it's what people mention to you. Yes, you think there's more key life force in unpasteurized. Um, um, Adita, you say, you say he cannot speak anymore. Um, um, okay, sorry, I assumed it was a woman. I didn't know whether I said, uh, I don't, don't know if I said she. Uh, apologize. Uh, he cannot speak anymore. That's uh, uh, of the reason to. Um, he was vegetarian 25 years. Okay. Well, um, there may not be a lot that you can do. Um, um, it depends what he was eating as a vegetarian. Some vegetarians eat a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of cheese, uh, bread, um, kind of heavy breads, uh, maybe eggs, uh, and things which tighten the liver. Maybe a lot of you know a lot of kind of healthy wholemeal breads have quite a lot of salt in, and. Um, um, so that may have created without seeing him, you know, I really don't know. This is just, you know, conjecture, you know, but if he was, if he was eating quite a bit of those kind of foods, his liver, they could have caused quite a lot of tension in his liver, which might be contributing to him being more, more angry or irritable, um, 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 uh, or, or aggressive right now. I have to say as well that, you know, I really, really, really feel for people with dementia, having looked after my mum and come in contact with other people with dementia. Um, when you lose your memory and you don't know who, who's around you and what's going on and what's happening next, and it is so incredibly disorientating. It's, 
not surprising that they often become emotional and upset and frustrated and fearful and underneath you know underneath it is often fear so maybe also just check out if there's you know he's he's fearful um it can be very labor intensive um looking after people with dementia uh, but having people around keep explaining what's happening you know entertaining them finding things which they still can enjoy doing um you know can really also help uh, reduce um uh, kind of upset and, and aggression i think okay so th thank you uh, uh, edita um uh, uh, i hope that's been somewhat helpful um yeah i just um yeah you have my sympathies um um if you're looking after that patient and uh, yeah it's tough work looking after people with dementia okay i wonder if there are any other uh, questions uh, nobody really asked questions about um about allergies um uh, some of you still there so maybe I could just ask you the question to finish off with, are there any particular subjects that you would like me to cover on future Tuesday evenings? Um, because um, I'm happy to talk about a lot of different subjects. So it would be interesting to know from you if there are any particular subjects that would be helpful for you. So I'm just gonna give that a minute to see if anything comes through. Um, uh, that would be helpful for me or else I will just choose my own subject. Uh, often what I do is uh, from the clients I've seen or the students I've seen over the previous week, certain things have stood out and then I think, oh yes, that will be, be a good subject to talk about. Okay, nothing come through. So I think I'll end the session uh, there. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, then please come along uh, next Tuesday. I'll be here at 7.30 again on another subject and also answering any questions that uh, you want. And I'm quite helpful, help, you know, open to giving some personal advice if it's possible in a condensed form, you know, as I did um, uh, for Sarah earlier. Um, and uh, if you have friends who think would be interested, please tell them about it. And uh, if you want to learn more in depth, uh, we run a range of uh, online courses uh, as well as on-site courses here in Devon. So um, you can check all those out on our website. And um, yeah, uh, be wonderful to see you. So thank you very much for coming along. Um, uh, great to have you all here tonight. <laughs>